Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning. This is Everything Co-op. Good morning to you. This is a wonderful, wonderful day in Washington, D.C. And our guest today is Jamila White. Jamila is in D.C., and she's very, very active. Good morning, Jamila. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Happy Thursday. Happy Black History Month. Great. Yes, it is Black History Month. It is a great Thursday. I'm glad you took out time of your busy schedule to be with us this morning to talk about your life, your work, and about co-ops. So let's start off by getting to know you a little bit. Where are you from? Where were you born? Ooh, where was I born? I was actually born in Connecticut. I was uh, born in Hartford, Connecticut, and my parents, um, that's where my dad is from, but they had been living there for about five or six years before they had me, and after I was born, they moved back down to this region, so they moved to Virginia, to Fredericksburg, Virginia, specifically, and that's where my mom is from, and I came back at less than one years old, and I grew up between Fredericksburg and D.C., when my parents um, decided to part ways, my dad moved to the city. He moved to D.C., southeast, and um, my mom stayed in Fredericksburg. So my sister and I um, made D.C. and Fredericksburg our home. So Fredericksburg, my next guest next Thursday is from Fredericksburg, fourth generation black family farmers. Um, and they're the Fredericksburg Co-op, food co-op that just opened up. And so uh, Rich Lo uh, Low Rochelle is, uh, helped to start that. And so they will be on next week. Uh, Anita Robinson is the lady's name. Actually, yeah. it's a very familiar with the name. So I'll have to tune in. And it's just glad to see that the roots just across the DMV. Yes, yes. Uh, so you graduate from high school here in D.C. in the district? Or in Fredericksburg? I know. I, gradu I graduated from high school in Fredericksburg. I actually graduated from the same high school as my mother graduated from. And it's interesting because we would talk about, you know, how when she was going to school, Fredericksburg was segregated. And she was in segregated schools until she was in about the seventh grade. And so when I was in school, it was just really an overwhelming experience to think that the same school, some of the same faculty, you know, mm. are here when my mother was here when the school was segregated had just started to be integrated. And you can still feel that very racial apartheid feeling at that time when I was a student 20 something years ago. I only gave you 20 something. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Six years ago. Six years ago. What are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> what am I talking about? <laughs> okay. But I had that same experience. We integrated in 1955 in West Virginia, Bluefield, West Virginia. I was in the third grade. And so mm -hmm. and then my mother ended up teaching in that school with a lot of the same racism, same principle that I went to school with. So that racism still exists that we've seen with Donald Trump open up the gates so people could express their racism and everything. Oh, don't want to go there. OK, let's go back. <laughs> graduated. <laughs> you graduated from Fredericksburg, same high school as your mom in college. Where did you go to college? I went to college at Hampton University. Oh, the other HU. Okay, the other one. <laughs> Not this fake thing that we have, uh, you know, over on Georgia Avenue, but um, definitely went to the real HU. And it was interesting because um, both of my parents, my parents met in college. They met at Virginia State University. And so they, I just grew up uh, with a vast appreciation for HBCUs, going with them to homecomings going with school groups to different homecomings. So when I was graduating, I knew I wanted to go to HBCU. And a lot of it, quite frankly, had to do with the racism we experienced in high school. Um, I've always been the social justice, black liberation activist. And so, you know, carrying that weight and carrying that a lot more with me and standing up against it and being <laughs> suspended, <laughs> um, <laughs> conducting demonstrations at school incidents in the library and stuff. And so, 
for me, I just knew that my first time kind of getting out into the real world needed what was going to be at an HBCU. And not to mention at that time how I was in love with a different world and just knew that Hillman was Hampton University. And that's where I was going <laughs> to have my, my Hillman experience. I'm surprised it wasn't Virginia State, but now I understand the influence. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're at Hampton, the other HBCU. I got it. Okay. And I taught five years at, at Howard. I wish I could have gone to Howard. I went to Bluefield State College, HBCU that was taken over by white folk. It's 95% white now. Don't want to go there either. So where did you, you got a master's degree? So from Hampton, I got my bachelor's in business and in French, but Hampton is really, um, my experience in Hampton really set the shape for the next era of my life for the last, you know, couple of decades. When I was studying French in, in business at Hampton, I had intentions of going into the fashion industry. I was really interested in diversifying the fashion industry and focusing on body shaming, especially the body shaming of black women. And to progress in fashion, you needed to speak French. So I started in high school, continued French in, at Hampton, and my professor encouraged me to study abroad as a way to sharpen my language skills, especially to have much more of a conversational and a native touch. And I was excited. I was like, yes, I get to go to France to study abroad. I was telling my mom, and she was like, of course. I never left the country. Um, my mom had never left the country, nor my grandmother. Very few members of my immediate family had traveled globally. So this was a big experience for us. And I was 19 years old. And where'd you go? Well, when my teacher, when I told her, yes, I want to spend the summer in France, she was saying, I think you should go to Africa. And I was like, huh, why would I go to Africa to learn French? And she was like, well, I think you should go to Senegal. There's a wonderful program in Senegal that I think you would love. And so she helped me um, complete the application, and I was accepted to the program in Senegal. And I spent the summer in Senegal studying French and Wolof, which is a local language. And being in Senegal, I still remember the very first time I felt the continent. It's something about when you get off the plane in Africa, every single time it's magical, but you never forget the first time. And the doors open, it's the dead of night. There wasn't very many uh, lights at the airport, but immediately you felt this warmth, this hug when you got off the plane. And I, and I just it made my skin and my entire body glow and warm. And I didn't know what it was. And I started crying. And I'm 19 years old. It's three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> People are looking at me like, what's wrong with her? And I didn't know at the time it was it was me coming home. And in Senegal, you know, that was the first time I experienced absolute poverty for the first time. Well, witness, not experience, witness absolute poverty, but absolute beauty and the convergence of those two and the resilience of that. And from there, within days, my dreams of working in fashion quickly disappeared. And I knew and that kind of solidified my life would be dedicated to the liberation of black people economically, socially for our own self-determination. And I'm sure my teacher, um, Professor Moore, and I still talk to her and tell her the huge impact she had on my life. When I told her, I'm not going to go into fashion, I'm going to go into black liberation and justice somehow, she had this smile on her face and was like, oh, good to hear this. And she actually met me in Senegal. She was in Senegal for the summer as a Fulbright professor. And she, you know, really helped shape my learning. And and she saw something in me, a spark, and, and wanted to open that up and provide access you know, to my eyes to a bigger world because, you know, I was not exposed to that bigger world. Right. And so from there, back to Hampton and took more French classes and really positioned my the rest of my college experience, not so much to, to, to the business world, but looking at international affairs and African affairs. And I finished Hampton and went and got a master's degree from Indiana University in public uh, administration and international economic development. And so... I want to go back. That's how I okay, go ahead. Finish. Oh, no, that's it. That's how I, I made that transition where, you know, you saw this like dream of you're going to work. And then all of a sudden you have an amazing experience at such a young age that sparks something in you that you, you carry, carry out. So Professor Moore was able to be the excellent ideal professor 
to bring out of you what you didn't even know was there. I taught 12 years, and whenever you get that experience, that's the payoff. So you gave her a tremendous payoff. But I want to go all the way back to absolute poverty and absolute beauty. What are what was that contrast? What was that? The contrast was how could something so beautiful and amazing at the same time not have the resources, at the same time to be so excluded? And it was like, this is the most beautiful place I've ever seen. How come it doesn't have all of the, the resources, the riches that I see? How come the few that had that didn't look like this absolute beauty, to tell you the truth, <laughs> mainly were expatriates? And so that contrast you said white was people, like expatriates. They were white folks that had the money. Non black folks, the white yeah. folks, other non black people of color, and the systems that it was created. And, and I just couldn't understand because this is the most beautiful magical place I've you've seen between the people tall dark it's like that shiny beautiful sun kiss the land the nature the water everything it's like this is this is paradise but how come the people are suffering so much and so that was the the, the click like this doesn't make sense why is this happening why the country is free it's decolonized and you know at 19 I didn't know what I know now but would soon discover the reasons why I had the same experience in Sierra Leone, same exact experience. Okay, so you've gotten your bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, you've gotten the light turned on. Um, tell me, where are your parents in all of this as you're making this transition from fashion to liberating black folk? You know, it's very interesting because my parents in all of this, you know, in D.C. and in Fredericksburg, it was like, okay, she went to Africa. She came back from Africa and then actually spent my senior year. Um, I didn't mention this. I got an internship with the State Department and I learned about the State Department when I was in Africa. Some of the other students that were studying abroad. Well, they were all white. I'll just say that I was the only black student who was studying abroad from America. The rest were white um, and they all came from PWIs. And so in the majority of them were studying public policy or so what, international relations. What's PWI? Oh, predominantly white institutions. Okay. And so they were studying policy and international relations. And at that time, Hampton didn't have an international relations degree field. Most, um, it was only a few HBCUs at that time that had any type of global studies. So I'm coming, you know, as the only black student <laughs> to Africa for a study abroad and exchange experience. And it was so much juxtaposed around that experience too with being a black person with these other 10 white students and the racism they're bringing with them in Africa and me combating that. So it was a whole experience, if you can imagine. But throughout the experience, I've met some, met one of the, the closest friends I have. And she's the one who told me about the State Department. And literally, I applied the last day that the applications was due. Once I got back to Hampton, I was in the library because I used a fax machine. This is when you had a fax application. <laughs> and so in the fax machine, in the library at 11 o'clock, trying to fax my application because it was due at 11.59. So, you know, I'm in here at 11 o'clock. And I got um, the internship at the State Department. So I was sent to Abu Dhabi. And I had the, the privilege of working at the U.S. Embassy in Abu Dhabi. And I spent my senior year in, at the embassy and then in France, again, for a second study abroad. And my parents was just like, it's so much going on. You're moving all over the place. And my grandmother was the really one who's like, go, keep going, baby, keep going, keep going, do everything we've never been able to do. And it was just so supportive. And my grandmother will always remind me of where we came from with her mother being a mammy for white households and then her really taking care of children, taking in laundry for white households, being able to put her daughters in college so that that, you know, that that domestic service, which is nothing wrong with that. But in the mammy way, really got broken. But it, we didn't do it alone. It was from the collectiveness of the community, the support that the entire community put towards us to have. And so they were extremely supportive. They were able to put their money together to support me. But Hampton also gave me a scholarship. Thank you. Hampton gave you a scholarship, which is great. We have to take our first break. Sorry for the quick cut in, but we'll be right back. Please don't text that down. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Co-op. We have Jamila White on with us today. She's told us so far that she 
grew up in two households between Fredericksburg and Southeast D.C., mom in Fredericksburg. And when you talked about your grandmother, is that your mother's mother or your father's mother? Your mother's mother. Yeah, my mother's mother. Okay, so she's in Fredericksburg also? She was. She passed about five years ago. Okay, sorry to hear that, but you had her a long time, so that is great. And um, so you've come from a long line of trailblazing women is what you've said. Who are those women in your life that helped you? That's a wonderful question. I look at the women as blood relatives, but also our kin, because in the communities that I was raised in, it was truly like a village. My mom and dad both lived on the South Side, both still live on the South Side. And growing up in the 90s and the late 80s and early 2000s, it was that Black community where people looked out for each other. When I would do stuff, my grandma would get calls. And before I got home, she was already on the porch waiting to beat me. <laughs> oh, one second. But see, when I grew up in the 50s and 60s, my mother would get a call on Tank Hill. We lived on top of a hill in West Virginia. But the call was, hey, Flory. That was the call. It was no telephone back then. <laughs> okay. Yes, I, I, I know that experience. But we might get the spanking out there from one of the neighbors not and when we got home go ahead I'm, keep going i know what you're talking so, about so that, that, was, that was the difference because you know so many of our mothers were working and so it was the grandmothers in their community taking care of everyone but since they were elderly they couldn't really chase you so you had to wait to get <laughs> home before you got the discipline so that was a generational difference because it was like i know i'm gonna get in trouble but i don't have to get in trouble twice because you can't catch up to me and so um my grandmother was a huge, my mother's mother was a huge influence just on my life. We, my parents, my mother and my sister and I, we moved in with her when my parents separated and lived with her for a couple of years. And so I would get all the stories. I would get all the lessons. She started teaching us to read and write at an early age. And I was able to enter kindergarten at four years old because she said, well, you can read and write. It's time to go to school. And she forced the school system to take me at four. She was like, no, test her. She can go. And this is, you know, when it was rules that you couldn't start to a certain age. But it was her advocacy that, that got me into school early. And my grandmother's mother, though I didn't know her personally, I felt her spirit and guidance. And in so many of the principles that she did and so many of the investments and seeds she sowed that, that I realized. My mother, of course, my dad's sister, my Aunt Lula, she was a freedom fighter. When she graduated from college at 22, you know, she joined the bus of freedom riders to ride down to Mississippi to protest racial segregation, being arrested, spending her summers um, in Parchment's prison, you know, for, for protesting racial apartheid and black terrorism in the U.S. My Aunt Dorothy, who is a um, still alive, she's a union organizer. She retired a few years ago, but she spent her life organizing labor unions, particularly for black and brown people in manufacturing. And so these are some of the women who just inspired me and poured into me so much as, as we go out. And then we have people in the community like Ambassador Bridgewater, who, when I got that internship at the State Department, had never, you know, worked before, had, had been to Africa on a study abroad, but never traveled professionally, bringing me into her home and just making sure I was prepared for that experience, mentally prepared, socially prepared, and that I knew what I was coming with and that I was confident and that, you know, that environment that I was going to be in, that I knew that, that that I was just as good. Because she was right. When I got to the embassy, I was the only black intern, the only person from an HBCU. Most of the other interns were from Ivy League universities. Majority of them came from upper classes, upper middle income, higher upper middle income, and just had a lot more access in networks than I've had spoke three and four different languages, had traveled to 30 or 40 countries already, where this was my second time leaving the U.S. But what, what my family instilled in me and those women is that confidence, that you are, you earned, you, you have this, this is your birthright. We have already built this for you. And so I didn't feel that level of insecurity, nor did I feel that I had to assimilate or change who I was. And because of that, I was able to get opportunities and recognition at the State Department um, that summer that others didn't. And it was the ambassador of the embassy actually said, 
I want you to be a foreign service officer and pull me into her office before I left and have four of the foreign service officers just talk to me about how can we get you in the foreign service after you graduate. And when I asked my other interns if that happened to them, they were like, no, they didn't do that to us. She didn't, she didn't do that to us. And I was like, oh, well, we're going to see the shake tomorrow. And they were like, we don't get to go. And then there was like some jealousy and then she had allowed other people to go. But if my family and these women didn't instill to me like you are enough, absolutely the intimidation could have been there coming from the South side, coming from an HBCU, coming from, you know, a middle class, working class family and not thinking I was good enough. But I knew I was good enough and I knew that I wasn't just good enough, but I'm going to show you what good should be and model that behavior. And so so many women just really, really poured into me. And then teachers growing up, you know, having a black uh, teacher in elementary and middle school and high school made a huge difference, especially in high school when I would get in trouble a lot from standing out, speaking out, having another black teacher say, no, she can't be suspended. No, you're not going to suspend her and stuff like that. So so your trouble was speaking out against? It was speaking out and speaking back. Um, you know, it was. I just had this thing where sometimes these teachers, well, some of my white teachers would just use a lot of like anti-blackness language. And, and this is before I knew the language. And I would say that's racist, that's this. And, you know, you get sent to the principal's office, you get detention for calling a teacher racist or saying, why are you punishing? A lot of times it was like, why are you punishing black boys primarily? Why are you punishing him? Why are you kicking him out of class? He didn't even start the trouble. And it's kind of like, well, mind your business. And then you both get sent to the principal's office. So, but it was the black teachers at the school who really fought for us. And they were mainly black women teachers who would be like, no, they're coming. When they found out we're in the principal's office, they're coming down there too. So fascinating i um mostly had white teachers starting from the third grade throughout middle school which was called junior high back then high school uh fortunately i had a really good he was a white coach but he was really really good and fair and taught a lot but i really enjoyed going to the historically black college and having black teachers stand up for you tell you not only what was happening in the class well i double majored in math and chemistry I wish I had known about business back then, but math and chemistry were my two. And my chemistry professor, I majored in that because I just liked him and I worked in a chemistry lab. And he would just pull me aside. Same thing with the de the department chair of the math department and just talk about life and what you can expect in this world. So you, you get the math or the chemistry and how these things work, but then there's real life stories that happens and so forth. So, yeah, I I get it. And that's what it takes a village to raise a child and you had a wonderful village with all of these women and teachers and this ambassador Bridgewater she was a you uh, ambassador to some country US ambassador to some country yes ambassador Bridgewater who is a just such a huge inspiration um, in my life she's from Fredericksburg too she now lives between Fredericksburg DC and Kentucky um, but ambassador Bridgewater has been the US ambassador to Jamaica the U.S. ambassador to Ghana, the U.S. ambassador to the Gambia in Benin, I believe. And she is a retired diplomat who spent more than 30 uh, years in the Foreign Service, breaking so many barriers. Ambassador Bridgewater, I think she went to Virginia State or Virginia Union, too. And she taught at Howard for a while and taught at Morgan State for a while, too, when she was in her time in the U.S. But she's since started an organization, the Africa Summit that works to build bridges in relationships between the Black African diaspora, including the descendants of American slaves and enslaved Americans, and also the continent. And you had her teaching you and training you, took you under her wing to tell you, this is what you can expect when you go to Senegal or when you go to, and this is what you can expect from the State Department and what you can expect from these other white kids and what you need to do to make sure your passport's right, you got your right. What's that shots in the arm and all of these things? you got to have all of this stuff together. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just in the roadmap and mentorship that, you, that, that our community doesn't have access to all the time. Okay, so we've got you in Africa. we got you growing up in Fredericksburg and D.C. We've got you talking to your grandmama, your aunts, and all of the women in your life. And so when we come back from our next break, I really want to get into, definitely got to get into co-ops and how you get into cooperation. And you said that you want to make sure that people have 
a dignified life. And I want to break that down a little bit of co-ops and your dignified life. So Senegal, and also you were in the Caribbean. So we'll talk a little bit about the Caribbean when we get back and then talk about how you've been living your life and what you're doing now in this next half an hour. And we'll be right back. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative, and Jamila White is our guest today. This program, we've been on the air over eight years, and the National Cooperative Bank has been our primary support, financial and otherwise. NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. And so they've been very, very helpful and just a really good partner in providing this information. So, Jamila, talk to me a little bit about your experience in the Caribbean. Yeah, so working in the Caribbean is pretty amazing, I will say. Um, It's the best of all worlds (laughs) in terms of being very close to home and being able to get close to home, but being in predominantly Black cultures. And when I graduated from Indiana University, I actually went back to Africa. Um, my first job was in, like, first paid job was in Liberia. And when I was working in Liberia, I actually started working for cooperatives because I was working on an agricultural development program for women who had participated in the war in Liberia. Liberia was in a 20-plus year civil war that ended in the early 2000s. And so shortly after the war, I um, got a job in Liberia working for a American Liberian NGO, non-governmental organization, working on agricultural programs with these women. And so it was just so interesting from going from business school, studying business and fashion and French at Hampton to public policy at Indiana University. And then my first job is the agriculture program officer. And I had been to a few farms before, can't remember any real farms that I've been to did not know anything about agriculture or even let alone gardening. But I learned from these women. They are the ones who actually taught me and I learned from my other colleagues. At that time, I worked, like I mentioned, for a primarily Liberian organization, which is very different for most Americans. Most Americans who work abroad work for U.S. organizations or work for the U.S. government. But we were receiving funds from the U.S. government and the U.N. to do these programs. And that's when I really fell in love with the land and with agriculture and food systems and understanding sustainable development and the role that it plays in self-determination and continuity. And so from working in Liberia and working on the continent, a lot of times you would be in country and some type of crisis or conflict may start. And all of a sudden you have to stop your agriculture work and provide support and relief for whatever conflict is going on. So I've worked a couple of conflicts as well in West Africa when I was also working on agriculture. And when Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas in 2019, I was sent out to the Bahamas to help them with their economic recovery. And a lot of the skills, I would say almost all the skills that I gained and experienced to be able to do economic recovery work after a conflict or disaster came from working in Africa. And I was in the Bahamas, primarily Grand Bahama Island, because it was it was two islands that were impacted the worst. And I was there helping to primarily work on work with small businesses to recover. And we worked to set up a small business fund and raise a couple of million dollars, primarily from corporate and private sector, to be able to get relief funds into the hands of small businesses as quickly as possible. And the Bahamas insurance is not really accessible. It's not that people don't want insurance, but it's extremely expensive and difficult to actually cash in on policies. So unfortunately, more than 70% of businesses 
and 70% of homeowners and uh, home dwellers did not have insurance. So they lost everything, their businesses and their home completely gone, flat, nothing there. And there was only so much support that the government could do because of the scale and the volume. I mean, Abaco Island, one part of it was completely washed away, like it was gone. And, you know, it's billions of dollars that the, the government of the Bahamas is going to need over time to try to rebuild or figure out how they can even rebuild. But we were able to to develop an economic business fund and to bring that relief to um, a couple thousand business owners. And then I was when I was there, we were providing clean water through like this fancy osmosis. The water system actually eroded. And so the ocean overtook the drinking water and clean water system for about six months. So for six months, when people turned on their taps, it was salt water coming out. So, Okay. So to be such a young person, you have a rich, rich history from Fredericksburg and D.C. <laughs> through Africa and the Caribbean. So when did you get back to D.C.? Uh, decide that you wanted to live in D.C. and start your business here? So I knew I wanted to come back home about six years ago when I was still actually in Africa. So between Africa and the Caribbean. And I was working in Sierra Leone, actually, at the time. And I had started working in Sierra Leone, work, working with cooperatives, and Ebola hit. And so when Ebola hit, um, you stop what you're doing and you work on Ebola. And so it was throughout the Ebola um, outbreak and the Ebola response that I realized the changes that needed to happen to see like that self-determination really was a change the relationship and the focus on decolonizing international development, which is really shifting power between predominantly white Western countries and black African countries. And so I have made a decision that I'd be returning back to the U.S. to really elevate issues of racism and anti-blackness within foreign policy, within international development, and within the way we do relations. And so that was a real impetus for me to come back home. And when I got back home about five years ago, I started to use my platform, use these networks that I had developed, and use the, the, the contacts to really elevate these issues. And when no one was talking about racism, when you weren't allowed to say the word racism, <laughs> quite frankly, without receiving so much backlash, and so that was a real change for me. It's like, well, this is a policy change. This is bigger than certain programs. This is an access issue, and we have to we have to change it from that way. Okay. So I got that you are an advisory neighborhood commission in Ward 8 in Washington, D.C. So how did that come about? That's funny. That, that's, that came about very recently. It was actually through COVID. In 2020, when, um, like, right around the time we shut down, I, I wasn't really, I have to admit, I wasn't really following COVID very much because I was in the Bahamas, and then I was coming back from the Bahamas at the beginning of 2020. And my mom is the one who said, have you been paying attention about this new virus, COVID? And I was like, no, I've been in the Bahamas working on economic recovery. I've been thinking about nothing but small business development. And so... I started to pay a little bit of attention and some of my friends from globally who worked on the Ebola outbreak and other pandemics and, and global outbreaks started contacting me and I started seeing my, my um, email address added to listservs for first responders and I'm like, what is going on? And then I was like, oh, we're, we're heading towards some type of outbreak, something serious. And when we were about to shut down, it was like, oh, no, this is real. I actually sent the, the mayor a four-page letter <laughs> one night. I was like, we have to do something. We have to do something. And I was in the position of being a first responder, being able to help communities and people prepare for disasters, whether it was a, a, a most of these disasters are man-made, just to be quite honest, mm -hmm. man-made disasters, um, to recover from them and to be more resilient, to be able to uh, cope with them in the future. And this was the first time that something was happening right here in my own community, my own backyard, and I felt so powerless. Like, there was nothing I actually could do. Just as a citizen, just sitting in my desk, like, it was nothing I could do. And so I said, well, what I can do is to write a letter to the mayor and to our government leaders advocating for um, support for Ward 8. And I wrote this letter providing suggestions of things that the government could do to really make sure that my community 
was equipped to deal with this pandemic. Because, you know, I know from working on pandemics, you could think, oh, this is just a couple of months. But we we battled Ebola for almost a year and a half before, no, almost two years before we came to the end of the outbreak. And so I knew it was a, what, you, what happens when you don't get control of it soon. And the reason I was so concerned about Ward 8 is because we were already in a pandemic. We were in an economic pandemic before that. Just some things about my community. Like, we didn't have access. We were a food apartheid. At that time, we only had one full-service grocery store in the entire community of almost 80,000 people. We didn't have access to fresh, healthy foods. So, therefore, our health indicators were much lower than other communities. The life expectancy for Ward 8 is 20 years younger than the, the rest of the city. So we say when you cross the bridge, you lose almost 20 years of your life just because of not having access to food, not having access to health care, not having access to the amenities you need to live, live a healthy and prosperous life. And a lot of these are based on based because this is a this community is, has been impoverished for so long. So you're really hitting on this year's theme of Black History Month is health and wealth and the, the, the value of health in our communities. And so when we don't have food, we don't have access to clinics, when there is racism, all of these different, when there's buildings that have lead in them, whether it's water or paint, all of these different environmental kinds of issues, whether it's ozone in the air or whatever, when you cross that bridge and get into Ward 8, and I've I managed properties in D.C., so I managed properties in Ward 8, and I got to know families in Ward 8. Good, good, great, great, great people and being really dumped on in a lot of different ways so that you end up losing 20 years of life. And what's also worse than that for me is that the quality of life when health is bad, it goes down also. And in some of these apartments, one bedroom or two bedroom, there's this big freezer. I said, why do you have this big freezer? Because they'd have to take a taxi or bus to a store and then bring a taxi to bring them back or one of these guys that have a car and bring it back. So they had to do a lot of shopping and they would end up having to get stuff and put it into the freezers. So yes, quality of life goes down in our in our neighborhoods. And I didn't know it was a 20 year life differences, life expectancy difference. You'd be surprised the average median income for War A residents, which were 90% black, is $38,000. The average median income for the rest of D.C. is well over $100,000. So there's huge disparities. And we knew that we would have secondary impacts that were much greater than the rest of the city because we didn't have this ability already. And so that was really what I was trying to address in the, the letter I sent to the mayor. Did Mayor Bowser uh, respond to you? Um, she did not. I, my council member did, and the community did, and asked me to run for ANC. And so that's how I started. And so one of the things I do do remember at that time, when I wrote the letter, we hadn't had a confirmed case in Ward 8, and I said that we will be impacted the most, even though we don't have any cases. We were the last ward, and we've had the most deaths in the entire city. We have had the most deaths this ward. Well, I knew it was going to hit us hard. I, I have diabetes and hypertension from my mother and my father and from generations, this generational health stuff, and that it was going to hit our community the hardest. So I, I put took myself out two weeks before anybody else did, before the mayor or anybody said anything. It's like, I know I have to be home, but I have too much I want to do. At, I'm 70. I mean, I'm my 75th year on this earth. And so my immune system was down. We're going to come back. we got to talk about co-ops. I really love, enjoy talking about your life, but we'll come back and we'll talk about co-ops and things that you're doing there. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Your news talk station. Information is power. This is why WOL is a, a great, great partner, which we've been on now for eight plus years. But, you know, it's not information that gives you the power. I had a gentleman on named Papa Sin from Senegal uh, the first month that we were uh, on the show. And he said it isn't information. It is action. You have to get into action in order to get the power from the information. So we're talking to a young lady that has been in action 
she's in action, and we want to talk about some of the actions now that she is doing and that she's bringing power to Ward 8. Great talking to you, Jamila White. So tell me some of the things you're ANC commissioner and advisory neighborhood commission. Your neighborhood asked you to do that. So what are some of the things that you're doing in the neighborhood to help the folks that have no food or healthy foods and poor health? What are some of the things you're doing? Good question. A lot of the work that I've been doing since the pandemic has started has been around mutual aid and being active in the mutual aid network. And you can think of mutual aid as something that's been just ingrained in a bedrock in the black community since we were brought here to this country and even before. And that's neighbors helping neighbors, knowing that our needs will not be met for the system. The system was designed not to meet black folks needs. If I want to be just quite honest and that we're going to have to dig into our community connect collectivity and use the assets and the resources we have to support each other and help each other meet their, meet our needs. So the East of the River Mutual Aid Network, which consists of Ward 7 and 8, really got off the ground in March 2020, thanks to um, Black Lives Matter activists, April Goggins, and many other activists around and organizers in the city to start this network. And mutual aid over the last two to three years has provided more than 14,000 families across Ward 7 and 8 with groceries, fresh fruit grocery delivery every week. And I'm one of the mutual aid drivers. We partner with Bread for the City um, on Good Hope Road to provide a warehouse where we have volunteers who are mostly from this community come together every day to package groceries and other volunteers deliver those to other members of the community. We do coat drives. We do um, back to school drives. We meet the community's needs from when people have been impacted by domestic violence, other forms of violence to get them to safety, to make sure they have housing accommodations. Um, When families have been impacted by fires or just crappy landlords, getting them into more safe accommodations and then providing access to resources that that are available. And a lot of the work I do is through the mutual aid. And more recently, my business has become a partner with the Ward 8 Community Economic Development um, Plan. And so we call it Ward 8 CED. It's run and led by a dear, dear, wonderful visionary, Mustafa Abdul Salim. Mustafa is also an ANC commissioner here in Ward 8 um, in the uh, 8C area. But Mustafa has brought together the community in such a powerful way where we are working to develop our first community-led, community-owned economic development plan, where we are taking our livelihoods into our own hands and saying we have the res- we have we don't have the resources but we have the solution here what we don't have is access and how can we change our future together and so Mustafa is really building off um, of some of the work that uh, Mayor Mary and Barry did to make you know DC Chocolate City his vision wasn't just to have masses of black people, but black people thriving, black people progressing, black people having the right to life that we deserve and having all of the economic and social opportunities that should be granted to anyone. And so really looking at how do we do that is by taking powership, taking taking power, taking ownership and giving that to the community and to pull from the community the solutions we have and to stop pushing down policies and programs that are not really moving the needle. And so that's what Ward 8 CED is doing. And a part of that process is looking at different models of coming together as a community to take ownership and really exploring the cooperative model, because that's something that we know has been uh, very much rooted in African culture, something that our community and our ancestors have done for thousands of years before we came here and even after we came here. And we know that by pooling our resources together, we can create that scale that we're looking for and have that collective ownership. And so it's been just a great pleasure for my my company, Blackwoody, to partner with Mustafa and the Ward 8 CED to bring this plan into fruition. What's the name of your company again? Oh, Blackwoody. I didn't even mention it. Blackwoody. Oh, you said it so quickly. It just went past Blackwoody. And that's equity with black in front, blackity. Okay. 
Okay. It is. So black equity and unity. And the unity is a, it's an important part as well, because we, we are looking for equity, but we are looking for unity because that's the difference. And that's how we keep our community together and have that collective care. And so Ward 8 CED has been on a process for the last two years. And one thing that's pretty amazing, Mustafa has really garnered private support for this project. Because in order for it to be community led, we needed the resources to be able to do this that was not influenced or kind of controlled by other actors. And so the goal is by the end of July or June, sometime this summer, that we'll have this economic development plan finalized and materialized that specifies how Ward 8 wants to develop, how the community wants for Ward 8 to develop, and what is the role in government for that. What do we need for government to do to create an enabling environment for us to develop equitably and inclusively? We know and we believe, well, I believe that poverty is primarily a policy issue in the effects of racist policies that have been passed down. And we know that humans create policy, people create policy, and people have the power to change those policies. Like, this is all man-made. And that's the part that's mind-blowing. It's man-made. And so it's going to be what is the role of government in changing those policies and creating new transformative progressive policies to create the enabling environment we want and to remove the, the, the systemic barriers that have been there. What is the role of the private sector in coming to work in our community, coming to partner with our community? And then what is the role of the community? How will we continue to lead this process and steward it? And that's where a lot of that cooperative thinking comes in. And so Mustafa has such a great background in cooperatives and workforce development with other members of the team who've done this type of work to come together and so we can have a plan for our community. So I want to say to you that this is phenomenal what's going on in Ward 8, but this is also going on in L.A. There's something called the Downtown Crenshaw Uprising, and they're attempting to buy a 43-acre mall in the whole Crenshaw area coming together. They did not get that land you're talking about redlining. This is redlining commercial. They had a better price for the land, and the white folks that were selling the land did not sell to the black folks, even though they could have made more money. They sold to a white developer who will put in high price housing, and they'll push out the blacks. So they're still fighting that in court. But it's happening in Ward 8, downtown Crenshaw, Shirley Sherrard, and the Southeast Georgia Project, Federation of Southern Co-ops in the 13 Southern states uh, of coming together. How do we do this cooperation, mutual aid, whether it's mutual borough societies or SUSUs and people pulling their monies together? They call informal banks. They were very formal banks but built on trust, okay, in the neighborhood where we helped each other. And and I've seen that in growing up in West Virginia. There was all kinds of people to put their feet up under my daddy's table, if they needed food, they got food, and that's what you're doing. So I'd like to see what I can do to help with uh, either, I don't know about driving or packing, because I'm still keeping my distance uh, for COVID, but that what I can help also. How do you feel about all of this? We only have a few more minutes, and what do you want to leave people? What do you feel about this work? How does it impact your heart? And what message would you like to leave people with? You know, the work that I'm doing now, it's it's quite remarkable because for the first time in my life, I feel completely aligned where my values are aligning with the work that I'm doing professionally, with the work that I'm doing in my community and the work that I'm doing in my family. Just, you know, I'm working with my aunts while they're, you know, still here with us to get our family history. They're like, can you go to this museum? Check it out. But just everything is aligning and knowing this is this is what I'm here to do. This is the contribution I have in the world. And the one thing I want to leave folks with is so much of my ideas came from when I was a youth. And when I was young, if I didn't have access to mentors who were older elders, who were my cheerleaders um, leading me on, I don't know if I would have been in the same place. And so my hope is for this generation. I love this generation, the ideas that they had, the tenacity the way that they're all, they like they're like born woke, and we just gotta nourish them and and connect them to this. And imagine if in the third grade, the fourth grade, you know about a co-op and you have a co-op in your school. Imagine how that changes the rest of your life in the way that you look at community and the way that you look at development and coming together. And it's just go back. We have to go back to our babies. We have to go back to our families, and we have to start young. 
And so that, that's my main message. I'm so inspired by this generation. So I want to tell you about John Hoseclaw, who uh, National Cooperative Bank is starting the Rochdale Principles. This is a CDFI in Washington, D.C. is a part of what they want to come and help. It's Rochdale Capital to figure out how to get capital. John is a great brother out of North Carolina and works for the bank. He's a senior vice president. So I want to hook you guys up. But everybody out there, we thank Jamila for being on today, and we hope that you have a great week. This this coming week will be next on next Thursday. Please live cooperatively. Your news talk station, 103.7.